home is the place where we can safely and privately test who we are. It is a place filled with family memories and future hopes. Although the dwellings of our American presidents range from grand mansions to one-room log cabins, they are filled with these same aspirations. Of the 42 men who reached the White House, one quarter were born into wealth and privilege, half a dozen were born into lowly circumstances, and the rest came from middle-class homes. This exhibit included photographs of our president's homes from coast to coast, as well as artifacts from featured presidents reflecting their affluent, humble, or middle-class roots. The centerpiece of this exhibit was a magnificent scale replica, Mount Vernon in miniature, from the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. This miniature replicates the home as it looked in 1799. Built to a scale of one inch to one foot, 52 skilled artisans put in over 4,500 hours to recreate each and every detail. George and Martha Washington's beautiful plantation home is located outside Washington, D.C., along the Potomac River in Virginia. The 22-room mansion was home to the Washingtons for over 40 years. Washington enlarged the original mansion several times, raising it to two and a half stories, adding two wings, designing the interior, and building the piazza that overlooks the river, one of the most imitated architectural features in America. Monticello is one of this country's foremost architectural masterpieces. Designed by a man of extraordinary talents, Thomas Jefferson was well-versed in philosophy, music, government, diplomacy, and architecture. Monticello, built on 1,000 acres, inherited from his father, reveals Jefferson's love of classical architecture and his quest for knowledge. He continually reworked his home over a 40-year period. To escape frequent visitors, Jefferson built a smaller retreat nearby in the foothills. This innovative octagonal house called Poplar Forest was set in the midst of a 4,800-acre working farm. Born into a gentry lifestyle of wealth and social position, Franklin Roosevelt seemingly had it all. Home base was Springwood, an imposing 35-room mansion with dramatic views of the Hudson River Valley. Summers were spent on Campobello Island in New Brunswick, Canada, a vacation resort for the wealthy. Here also is where FDR was stricken with polio in 1921. Overcoming his disability, Roosevelt went on to become one of America's most beloved presidents. A Texas oil man in adulthood, George Bush was born into an aristocratic New England household. Each summer finds the Bush family on a rocky outcrop overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. There, his grandfather had built a sprawling family retreat near Kenny Bunkport, Maine. While vice president from 1981 to 1989, the Bush family lived on the grounds of the National Observatory. Following are additional presidents who came from wealthy backgrounds. These photographs depict some of their homes, from birthplaces to post-presidential residences.
Born in Kentucky and raised on the frontiers of Indiana and Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's recollections included unbroken wilderness and a constant fight with trees and logs and grubs. As a young adult, he arrived in Springfield in 1837 and continued his transition from a backwoodsman to lawyer and statesman. In 1844, he and his wife Mary Todd moved into the only home he ever owned, expanding it to accommodate their growing family. The 17 years spent here were likely the best years of Lincoln's life. Hoover's life was a study in extremes, from a tiny two-room cottage in Iowa to a three-story, 18,000-square-foot mansion in California. This exhibit gallery reveals the swings of fortune that befell this orphan from West Branch, a self-made millionaire who lived and worked all over the world and rose to international acclaim as the great humanitarian. Hoover's popularity swept him into the White House but he soon became the scapegoat for the Great Depression of the 1930s. During his golden years at New York City's Waldorf Towers, Herbert Hoover regained much of his former reputation. Still today, however, his name is linked to economic depression. The following U.S. presidents also had humble beginnings. Nearly identical, the birthplaces of our first father and son presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, were brick homes covered with clapboard siding, enlarged with rear lean-to additions. Multiple fireplaces and small windows protected the inhabitants against New England's cold winters. In 1787, John and Abigail purchased Peacefield, an estate of 40 acres of orchards and farmland. The manor house was expanded with wing additions and surrounded with elm trees and a formal garden. Chester Arthur rose from a tiny cottage in rural Vermont to become an attorney in New York City. In 1865, Chester, his wife Ellen, and their children moved into a five-story brownstone where they entertained graciously. Only months into his vice presidential term, Arthur assumed the presidency after the assassination of James Garfield. Calvin Coolidge hailed from Plymouth Notch, Vermont, but later moved to Massachusetts where he practiced law and entered politics, eventually becoming governor. As Warren Harding's vice president in 1923, Coolidge was vacationing at his father's home when news reached them of Harding's death. His father, a notary public, administered the oath of office to his son by the light of a kerosene lamp. In 1929, Calvin and Grace Coolidge retired to their modest Northampton duplex until the steady stream of sightseers prompted a move to the Beaches, a secluded property behind iron gates in a grove of beech trees. Here are more Eastern presidents from middle class backgrounds.
A self-made man on the Western frontier, Andrew Jackson worked as a lawyer, judge, and planter, but it was his military leadership in the War of 1812 that brought him to national prominence. Jackson purchased a plantation outside of Nashville, Tennessee, called the Hermitage, but for 17 years, he and his wife Rachel lived in a two-story log house before building a fashionable home. Due to destruction from fire, the mansion was rebuilt twice, evolving from federal to Palladian to a Greek revival style. The final renovation featured a Greek facade with flat roof lines and massive two-story columns in which Jackson enjoyed his retirement. James Knox Polk was another log cabin president. The Polk family, however, was considered prosperous with 400 acres of North Carolina farmland and five slaves. They moved to Tennessee, where Polk eventually practiced law, was elected to Congress, and then governor. After his presidency, he retired to a beautiful home, Polk Place, in Nashville, only to die of cholera three months later. Contrary to his explicit instructions, the city destroyed the mansion after his wife Sarah's death in 1891. Other middle class presidents from the South are as follows. Hiram Ulysses Grant grew up in modest homes in Ohio and Illinois. At his graduation from West Point in 1843, a bookkeeping error listed him as Ulysses Simpson Grant, the name he used from that point on. What military duty kept him apart from his new bride, Julia, Grant resigned from the Army to settle on a 100-acre farm named Hard Scrabble near St. Louis, Missouri. The farm failed. Moving to Galena, Illinois, Grant suffered from business failures. Then came the Civil War. Grant's successful combat strategy and perseverance merited the attention of President Lincoln, who promoted Grant to lead all Union forces in March of 1864. After the war, Grant returned temporarily to Galena, whose citizens welcomed him with a beautiful Italianate-style home. A few months before Rutherford B. Hayes was born, his father died. His uncle stepped in to aid his mother and eventually sent Hayes to Harvard Law School. Hayes distinguished himself with military service, as a congressman, and in three terms as governor of Ohio. Rutherford and his wife Lucy set up house at Spiegel Grove, the original red brick home was built by his uncle in 1859 on 25 acres of wooded lands. Hayes enlarged it twice, creating a three-story Victorian with 33 rooms to accommodate his family of eight children and many grandchildren. Four generations of the Harrison family were active in government. Benjamin's great-grandfather signed the Declaration of Independence. His grandfather, William Henry Harrison, was our ninth U.S. president and Benjamin's father was an Ohio congressman. As a successful attorney in Indianapolis, 
He and his wife Caroline spent $28,000 in the 1870s to build a lovely 16-room Italianate mansion. During the 1880s and early 1890s, they lived in Washington, D.C., while Benjamin served first in the U.S. Senate and then the White House. William McKinley was born in Niles, Ohio. He served in the Civil War, practiced law in Canton, Ohio, became a U.S. congressman and then governor of Ohio. In 1871, he married Ida Saxton, and from 1878 to 1891, the couple lived in Ida's ancestral home. This Italianate mansion was richly furnished and included a third floor ballroom. Only the Adams, Harrison, and Kennedy families have produced as many political activists as the Taft family. William Howard Taft's father was a cabinet member, his grandson was a longtime U.S. Senator, and his great-grandson is currently the governor of Ohio. Taft practiced law, then served as a governor of the Philippines, Secretary of War, President of the United States, law professor at Yale University, and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. As Chief Justice, he administered the oath of office to Herbert Hoover, the only time in U.S. history that a former president has done this. Warren Harding grew up in a small town in Ohio, later achieving financial success after reviving the local newspaper, the Marion Daily Star. When he entered state politics, his wife Florence managed the newspaper and persuaded her husband to run for the Senate and eventually the presidency. The wide porch of their Victorian home made an excellent speaker's platform when Senator Harding conducted his successful front porch campaign in 1920. His presidential term was short-lived, however, due to his sudden death in 1923. Harry Truman lived in a succession of farmhouses and homes in Missouri as his parents' financial success ebbed and flowed. After World War I service, he married his sweetheart, Bess Wallace, and the couple settled temporarily into her mother's home in Independence. Built by Bess's grandfather in 1885, the Victorian home had seven bedrooms, a parlor, a music room, and colored glass windows that reflected Midwest prosperity of the 19th century. The couple stayed their entire lives, even returning in the post-presidential years. Born in Denison, Texas, Dwight Eisenhower grew up in Abilene, Kansas. Ike's military career began in 1911 as a West Point cadet. When America entered World War II, he served with General MacArthur in the Philippines. In 1942, he was appointed commander of the European Theater of Operations and rose through the ranks to become Army Chief of Staff in 1945. After two presidential terms, the Eisenhowers retired to Pennsylvania where Dwight built his wife Mamie her dream house, a rambling Georgian home with a sun porch looking out on the Gettysburg battlefield. In Omaha, Nebraska in 1913, Leslie King was born to parents struggling with their marriage. After the King's divorce, his mother took Leslie to Grand Rapids, Michigan. There she married Gerald R. Ford, who adopted and renamed the infant. Beginning in 1948, attorney and World War II veteran Jerry Ford served in Congress for the next 25 years. He and his wife Betty raised their children in Alexandria, Virginia. After one year as vice president to Richard Nixon, Ford assumed the presidency when Nixon resigned. In 1977, the Fords retired to a new home near Palm Springs, California. Deep in the vast Texas hill country, Lyndon Johnson was born in a dog trot house, so called because of the open breezeway running between two enclosed sections. He enjoyed a long and effective 24-year career in Congress. As vice president to John F. Kennedy, he assumed the presidency after Kennedy's assassination in 1963. LBJ succeeded in the areas of civil rights, the environment, and space exploration, but the turmoil over the Vietnam War bogged down his presidency. 
In 1969, Lyndon and Lady Bird retired to a quiet life on their Texas ranch where she still lives. Richard Nixon began life in a simple, modest house in Yorba Linda, California. Before entering politics, Nixon practiced law. His careers in Washington, D.C. included terms as a congressman, senator, and vice president to Dwight Eisenhower. He achieved the presidency in 1968, but when the cover-up of the Watergate scandal threatened his impeachment in 1974, Richard Nixon resigned. He and his wife, Pat, retired to La Casa Pacifica in San Clemente, California, a Spanish-style stucco home on three and a half acres with stunning views of the Pacific Ocean. A walk-up apartment was the birthplace of Ronald Reagan, where his father dubbed him a fat little Dutchman. After a boyhood in Dixon, Illinois, he became radio announcer Dutch Reagan at stations in Davenport and Des Moines, Iowa. Later a successful actor in Hollywood, he also served as California's governor. As U.S. President in the 1980s, Reaganomics shaped the economy at home as communism faltered abroad. Reagan and his wife Nancy retired to Rancho del Cielo in California. In 1994, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and died on June 5, 2004. And last but not least, we return to the world of miniatures. Eugene Cupjack was widely regarded as a pioneer and leading artist in the field of miniature creation. He combined exquisite craftsmanship with theatrical suggestion to create fascinating rooms in one-twelfth scale, where one inch equals one foot. Through clever lighting techniques and placement of objects, Cupjack created the illusion that a room's tiny inhabitants had just left the scene. His creations were completed without the benefit of computerized technology or high-tech bonding materials, and most detailing was done by hand. Although Eugene Cupjack died in 1991, his sons Henry and Jay carry on their father's legendary craftsmanship at the Cupjack Studios in Illinois. We hope you have enjoyed this look at the many different homes of our presidents. Shortly before the exhibit opened, Mount Vernon in miniature arrived in a semi-truck. Its eight large crates were carefully unloaded and the home was moved into the gallery. Okay, ready? With the side panels down, the furnishings in each room were unpacked and put in place. Workers who travel with the home used photographs to match the tiny objects with their proper position.
Side panels were then put in place and finishing touches were made. Then the hydraulic system was tested. The last step was cleaning and mounting large panes of glass around the home. 